Many people say that they want to write a book, yet nine out of every 10 people who start writing a book never finish it, leaving one of their biggest dreams unfulfilled. So what is it about the one in 10 people who do finish writing their book? What do they have and what drives them to complete their books, their plays, and their songs? Welcome to the Editor's Desk, where we explore their writing experiences, their motivations, and their struggles. And now, here are your hosts, author, writing coach, and self-publishing guide, Lynn Everard, and author, Louise Gomez. It's Thursday afternoon at 5.30 here on the East Coast, and we'd like to welcome you to the Editor's Desk. My name is Lynn Everard. Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Editor's Desk tonight. My name is Louise Gomez. Welcome. So, Louise, we have been dealing for what seems to be quite a few years mm -hmm. of people finding ways to be divided just about every possible way that we can be divided against each other. Yeah, agreed. Unfortunately, it seems like, I don't know if it's my imagination, or do, do you feel like it's happening more and more? Or it's, I don't know if it's because there's more social media and more media involved, but that separation, man, they keep, I feel like they keep trying to show us our differences instead of how similar we really are. Right, yeah. so we are very fortunate today to have a guest that has written a book called Defeating the Toxic New Normal, yeah, great uh, as he calls it. Uh, and before we introduce him, well, let's tell you a little bit about him. His name is Mike Burkhard. And uh, Mike is an independent author and speaker living in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. He's been married to his wife, Karen, for 38 years and has three adult children and two grandchildren. He's a lifelong student of human motivation and the mystery of the human journey. Previously serving as Human Resources VP for a global technology company, Mike purposely stepped away from that role to follow his dream to write, speak, and live a simpler life. And it is such a delight to be able to introduce Mike Burkhard, uh, partly because Mike and I grew up in the same town. Mm -hmm went to the same schools and so if you're watching us today from Krogan, New York, Woo! we'd like to give you a special welcome. And there's Mike. How are you, Mike? <laughs> Hi, Lynn. Hi, Louise. I'm doing great. Thank, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, we're, we're delighted to have you. Your book is fabulous and yeah. uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard to know where to start with a book like this, uh, but Perhaps you could share with us your motivation in writing it and what you saw in the world that prompted you to write this book. Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think I would start with uh, setting a context, and that is I'll share a number of stories today. Uh, and while they're my story, it's it's really everyone's story. And I I hope everyone sees in what I share uh, their own story. And that, that's part of the point of the book, that we each have a story. We go through a similar path in our lives. And in my opinion, we build empathy uh, through that. But that's the context. That's the background. You know, my, my life changed uh, when I was 30 years old. My mom died of cancer and it created a uh, lifelong search of why, why do people get ill? Why do people suffer? Why do some people experience joy and others sorrow? So it just opened my mind uh, a lot to this human journey I, I call the path of awareness. So I found through all my research and I had moved into human resources and my fascination with understanding the human experience that we all walk this path. We all have challenges. We all have joys and sorrows. And um, much of our life, our journey is, is a, a challenge with the mind and the subconscious and the things that we either tell ourselves we can't do or, or that we can do. And it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge of, of learning uh, through our life, through our experiences. 
So I became fascinated in all that, and I, I journal, took notes for 20 years. I wrote a thesis uh, when I was in uh, the company um, because I was in human resources and wanted to understand uh, human motivation more. And then um, I, I, I saw what was happening in the world, and I'm like, oh, goodness, the path of awareness for each of us, there's enough challenges. And then I saw this what I call a toxic new normal start to develop. And it was seeping into our subconscious as if the human journey wasn't difficult enough. It was seeping into our unconscious. And, oh goodness, we better shine some light on this, this toxic new normal when you combine the human journey which, with the things that were changing around us, things like this rapid technology advancement, including social media that Louise noted, uh, something I call increasing dehumanization, which I can talk further about, uh, and shifting demo uh, demographics around the world was another shift I saw uh, from a standpoint, and then rising stress levels. So all those things were combining with this uh, challenge in our, our lives of being the best people we can be. And I, I'm like, oh goodness, no wonder a toxic new normal is developed. By the way, I, I wrote all of this in 2019, well before uh, our recent challenges with COVID, et cetera, which seems to have made some things worse, uh, some things different. So that's the background. That's how I, I started. And, and that's what brought me to the book and, and where I even am today. You know, I loved when um, you had spoken into what you call a Kairos moment and how those moments affect our lives. And when he listed some things, I'm like, yep, check, check box for me, check, check, move, divorce, death, you know. And I realized for myself, those were pivotal moments of awakening and transformation, you know, maybe not in the moment, but as the time progressed and passed, were moments for me of reflection and pivotal moments in my life where I can honestly say I did gain more awareness. And so embracing the pain can, can be, you know, something that we get to do and not fear it, you know? And so thank you for eloquently highlighting that in your book because you did such a splendid job of talking about those moments and how we can use them to transform ourselves into a more aware and awakened person. You did a great job on that, Mike. So, yeah, so tell us where that concept... Much. You're welcome. Well, tell us where that Kairos concept came from. Well, that 20 years I talked about, I did so much research constantly audiobooks. I had to go to the library and check out a cassette tape in those days. Oh. Um, but uh, I don't remember the exact author or who came up with the Kairos uh, moment. But the whole idea there is that we each have, you know, four or five, maybe more experiences in our life that kind of send a jolt to us, shake our awareness and um, either changes for the better, we hope sometimes it doesn't go that way. Uh, for me, the experiences I shared, which hopefully will resonate with others, as I said, my story is others' story, but first was the one I mentioned already, my mom got cancer, and who thought out of such a negative thing it would change my life? I, I say uh, that my mom gave me life twice, the day I was born, and then the day, um, the day she got cancer and, and then when she died, I, it just changed my life. I learned so much about health and well-being and the power of the mind and, and eating well and taking care of ourselves. And that was a, a Kairos moment for mom when, when, um, when she dies. So the death of a loved one is certainly a, a tough thing. But, you know, you, you hopefully pause and learn from that. On, and, on, and there's positive moments, too. The biggest one for me that I remember that made a big impact early in my life was when I first became a father. Son Brian was born, and, uh, and oh, my goodness, it was a miracle to watch him being born. And I, I looked at him, and it, it changed my life. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I, I, the responsibility, the love I felt at a different level, it just changed my life. Sometimes I call myself an odd duck because of those kinds of things that, 
that I've gone through, but I, I do think people go through those. So you can think of other experiences, uh, some negative, some positive, that just changed your life and put you on a different trajectory. And uh, that's what that's what life is about. Agreed. Yeah, I, I love the way you've you organized the book and took us through these various steps and processes that we go through on this path of, of awareness. Mm -hmm. And, um, yes. you know, one of the things that I keep seeing over and over again, and, and so it must be something important, or perhaps just important for me to notice, is that uh, we all have beliefs, and, and those beliefs become so important to us, those beliefs become more important than our own happiness. Mm. And that it's like we would prefer to be right than be happy. And sometimes if we just stopped and said, you know, number one, is this belief true? And number two, is this belief making me happy or making my life better? Right. Right. What, what, do, what, what do you have to say about that? Yeah. Or making the world better. <laughs> That's right. Right. Well, well, you know, I mentioned these things that are happening in our society with social media, what I call increasing dehumanization. I mean, you look at movies, games, um, there's just, even in our, our news that comes via social media, there was another bombing in Pakistan, you know, 90 people dead or whatever. It's like, you see that the value, the sacredness of human is just a whole different experience now. And, and uh, my point of all of that is, you know, we're on this journey of awareness, each of us, and it starts when we're young and our experiences with how we grow up, the people around us, how we first experience love. Right. And, and so you, you learn and you grow through your experiences. Uh, and, and my point of the book is the way around and through these this toxic new normals for us to understand the impact we're having on the world. And I think to your question in the the biggest impact I see uh, is that people will post things on social media and we're like, oh yeah, we know, but they're so inflammatory or sometimes not so inflammatory, sometimes just a hint, but enough to start, start a fire, start it ablaze. And I believe that if all of us, people like that, I, I don't want to say I'm not included in that, I probably do my own thing, but if we could understand that we're setting a match uh, to the gasoline, and, and that it's only gonna make things worse. So that's a person that may not quite stop and pause and see how they're impacting the world. And, and that's the whole point. How do we each continue to learn and grow so that we wouldn't do something like that? Because the social media is not going away. It's how we use it that's gonna make the difference. You know, it, right. when you said that, it, it kind of brought up this thought in my mind that you know, it's one thing to poison the water supply, but it's another thing to poison the water supply that you're drinking from too, yeah. right? And I think sometimes yes. people forget yes. that, that, that they're, they're not just poisoning other people, they're poisoning themselves at the same time, or maybe the poison's already in them, and, and that's why that's coming out. Yeah, that's well, well said. And, and by the way, I, I said earlier, we all have a story, uh, I, I'm still learning myself. Um, I, I see different stories of people that do things and I say, oh goodness. And actually sometimes I'll be in my chair and I'll scream at the TV, how could you do that? Then I pause for a moment and say, okay, you know, we all have a story, uh, you know, how did they grow up? How are they impacted? Where are they in their journey? We're all, you know, we all should be getting better. Sometimes it's more challenging, certainly more challenging for others given many different circumstances, but it's a path of awareness we're all on, and uh, we can we can hope for the best. I, I I believe there's a lot of goodness in the world, and uh, and and we can it'll be a better world. I agree. Um, I think what was really helpful for me too, uh, if I can find it, were the diagrams. I really enjoyed how I'm a visual person. So you had those diagrams, uh, path of awareness. So right. it was like, oh, there's my circle. And then I, I just read, in, you know, <laughs> and I think it was very helpful for me. So I appreciated those diagrams as well. Thank you for that. That was good Great. idea. Very good I idea. Because some people are visual, right? Some right. people are visual and it, it, right. it, it's, you see things differently in, with a diagram. So that was helpful for me, for sure. 
Yeah, so one of the things that, I, that I'm really fascinated by uh, is, the, is this whole path of awareness. Uh, because we are, we're all on the path of awareness, whether we know it or not, it just depends upon the extent of our awareness uh, to know we're on the path of awareness. Uh, but you know, how do you like? How do you explain that concept to someone who's not really familiar with it? Mm, good question, Lynn. <laughs> well, th that that was the purpose of the diagram. Yes. Uh, it, it's difficult to do because we all have our beliefs and cultures, and I think it's hard to explain in words, Lynn. Um, we can do our best. I think everyone lives, and I think true change doesn't come through words necessarily. It comes through experiences, yeah. and, and, you know, the path of awareness starts with the birth of self and how you form from zero to seven years old, essentially, and then... The gift of love is step two and how you experience love and and there's there's choice and responsibility because the next two steps i don't have time to get into the the detail and then ultimate final two steps so which are the most powerful the the fifth step being the search for meaning um you know, we're all here for purpose and meaning uh, for many that's that's shut down they don't understand but if you're having a bad day a dark day it's probably because you haven't defined like a future you want to create and, and it's inherent in us. It's what we all live for. And it, it's hard to just share that with someone in words necessarily, but it's experiences we go through. And then, and then the God experience is that last uh, step number six. And you know, I, when I say God, I, it might freak people out these days. There's so many definitions or relationships and, uh, you know, I, there's a saying, I think it goes, uh, there is but one God, but, but within that one God, there are many. And I think that's very powerful because regardless of what you believe, there's something mystical about the world. There's something mystical about ourselves and there's something more mystical out there. And whatever we call it, I call it the God experience. I think it's very powerful. So it's hard to say exactly, Lynn, how you convey all that um it's it's but but therein lies the opportunity well and i think that's where <clears throat> your sharing your experiences uh was very helpful in the book because if there weren't words for something people could relate to the story of your experience yes even if they couldn't put words to it uh, one of the most touching parts of the book for me was when you told the story of having to uh, uh, prepare and deliver the eulogy for your dad. Yeah. Uh, yes. Because that really took, took me back into so many different things. And, and just that whole process and even the, the beauty of, of uh, some of your final moments, although they weren't exact, it, it, it never goes exactly the way we hope or the way we plan, uh, but that was just such a beautifully written uh, story yeah. of of the eulogy because it's like life; it's it was still unfolding up to the moment where you delivered it. Can you share a little mm. bit about that? About my experience with my dad well, uh, yeah and 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 the eulogy that you that you did for him as, as you developed yes it. sure well i mentioned my life is constantly changing and i'm learning and my niece uh, sent me an email that sent our family and she wasn't able to make the funeral and she said in that email uh i loved i loved gramp we all do the best we can with what we have and that sentence really touched me. And that was the theme of the eulogy. We each do the best we can with what we have. And my dad didn't have money. You know, he didn't know everybody's sporting events. He didn't say, I love you. And he didn't communicate well. And I, I used to judge him on that. I'm like, what am I doing? At some point, the light went on. And um, you know, I didn't want to judge my dad. I, I was judging myself. And I said, I'm gonna, I want to let go of that. I love my dad for who he is and not 
have him live to a standard that was mine. And so by the time I got to the eulogy a couple of years later, it was, you know, we all do the best we can with what we have. And, and my dad was that guy. And I believe that about everyone. We, we all do the best we can with what we have. And uh, it's, it's different for all of us. And uh, ultimately, you know, that whole story and how it impacted me, I, I love my dad more than ever once I let go of this standard that I set for my, myself, uh, for him. Well, thanks for having compassion and showing what true compassion really is, right? That yeah. really is yeah. very Yeah, and I think that part of the, of the book is so important uh, because uh, many of us have these standards for how the people in our lives are supposed to love us, Yeah. right? But the, but the challenge with that is, is that for most of us, we don't even know how we're supposed to love ourselves. Mm. But then we want to create a separate standard for somebody else when we don't even know if that standard <laughs> would even apply or even work for us, yeah. right? But it just, it just kind of pushes them away, mm. and it, but it doesn't do anything to help them or us. Mm. Especially yeah, that, that's so well said, Lynn, and, and there's the tragedy of life for, for many, and, and me included, I'm sure, at points in my time, in my life, but, you know, people, the, the awareness factor, some, many times, and boy, I was this way when I was young, I was a know-it-all, I'd rather have been right than to love. And that's a tough place to be. And it, I'm saying it, I'm saying what you just said, Lynn, with different words. If we could all let go, it's kind of that social media post. If we, if we could let go of having to be right and love, and, I, and it may sound corny too at times, but that, that's the whole point. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. And Mike, if I'm not mistaken, I know you traveled a lot in your, in your career that you had. I believe traveling is the best education for us as humans. I always want my kids to travel. I believe for you, um, can you share with us how did traveling impact your view of the world? I believe you mentioned it had a, a significant something. Maybe you can share with us how traveling impacted you. Know, in, in preparing for today, I'm like, how, what am I going to talk about for 30 <laughs> minutes? <laughs> we have a uh, there, lot. There's a lot. No, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's, again, easy to say, you kind of have to experience it, but when I, when I left the United States as a young adult, I was in product management, I went to Asia mainly, and that, that really impacted me, and at the time, the poverty in Asia was very, very different than what you would see in the U.S., and the U.S. has its own challenges, but the standard of living was very different in the countries I, I went to, including either uh, China, Taiwan, uh, Japan, I mean, Hong Kong, Singapore. I mean, some of those are very nice places to visit. I ended up in places that weren't as nice where we did some, some work uh, on production and things. But I think more than I was in Taiwan uh, and on a weekend, I went to visit a Buddhist temple. I was probably 31 years old and uh, I was looking around, I was just, I was amazed uh, and hit in the heart by the people that were just uh, honoring their Buddha. And I'm like, oh my goodness, they don't know who Jesus is. I was brought up Catholic. And in the next few days after reflecting, I'm like, oh my goodness, not everyone in the world is Catholic. Not everyone in the world has the standard of living. And I. I, I was flying back. I wrote in my journal over the Pacific Ocean on the way home. I, I'm like, I'll never, I'll never take for granted this country. I'll never take for granted what I have. And I, I could just see how big the world was and how many people and cultures and beliefs and wonderful people there were all striving to have the same things. And it really opened my eyes. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's and. Definitely. We're starting to get close to the end of our time here, Mike. I, it always goes by so fast. Uh, but you close your book talking about love. And, and I, I, I think it would be great uh, to, as we start to move to wrap things up, for you to, to talk about love and then to share with us what you have coming up uh, in your life uh, that, that is going to come next and uh, is going to light you up for, for this next fate, next chapter of your life. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. That's, that's nice. I, 
I'm, I want to just read a little bit of that love, because I don't know if I can say it any better, but, you know, uh, and then, um, yes, we'll, we'll go on. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know how many books end with love is the answer. This is me not reading yet, but, um, and, and the thing I've migrated to, it's like there's words and then there's feelings and it's, it's, you know, so words are words. So when I say love, what feeling does it bring forward? And so in that context, um, it's, uh, let's see, simplicity, empathy, forgiveness, acceptance, and most importantly, love are all found on the path of awareness. It seem, might seem trite to end with love as the answer, but that, that is the simple truth of life. And it comes fully alive through our experiences on the path of awareness that we're each blessed to travel. Love is always there, but not always easily found. It's beyond a word, feeling that lives in the core of our being. It's a feeling that we've accepted ourselves for who we are, a feeling of gratitude that our family is the greatest gift we could ever have, and a feeling of responsibility that we would only want to share the most encouraging of emotions with the world. So I'll, I'll stop there, but um, beyond the word to the feeling. Well, that's beautiful. So uh, beautiful. in a minute or two in a, or so, can you tell us what you have coming up that, that our audience? Yes, I, I have. Uh, I'm launching a brand. And, and by the way, Lynn, I've had so many fears, barriers, things in my life that stopped me from doing this, but I'm finally doing it. Yes. Uh, and I'm so excited, but I'm launching a brand called Goodness of Life. It's going to help people rediscover simplicity and joy. Uh, cultivate the hidden goodness in themselves, uh, nurture self-awareness to draw the best to them that they deserve, and, and renew the mystical uh, a bit. So I'm, I'm excited to launch that. I'd love to launch it within two to four weeks. It might be a little bit longer, but I'm, I'm branding goodness of life and sharing a lot with people, which will include, include writings and seminars. And then two books I have in the works in the next 18 months. One is called The Legacy Project, uh, 50 Human Stories of Life, Learning, and Love. And uh, it's really an anthology of 50 people that I need as volunteers to put their story in a chapter. And I have five questions to ask them, and they'll be oh, able to write their life story in, five, in those five questions. So I'm excited about that. Oh, and that's intent is to show that we all live a, a, the same path. The stories are a little different, but we we live the same path. And then um, last, the second book that I'm writing is called 52 Weeks of Goodness. And it'll be a series of reflections for, for the year. But, uh, and I'm writing, I'm writing that now. I'll be a volunteer for your anthology book. <laughs> that sounds exciting. You're in. Yeah, that's, I love that's it. terrific. So that's amazing. the legacy project. Yeah, that's we all want to, we all want to leave a legacy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mike, thank you so thank much you. for joining us today. It's been an absolute uh -huh. pleasure. Uh, as we leave you today, we want to tell you about you. next week's guest. And our guest next week is Bruce Starr, also yes. known as the love coach. Mm -hmm. And he's the author of a book called Her Teenage Love Coach. And uh, this is about an older man uh, who feels it in his heart to teach, teen especially teenage girls who, who don't have a father, father and a busy mother who mm. can't take the time to answer their questions and support them in these very awkward years of starting to discover who you are and, and, mm. and the world of dating and all those kinds of things. So we will uh, look forward to seeing you next week. And mm. until then. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Mike. We really appreciate you coming on to the show. Come to Florida anytime. We'd love to have you. Absolutely. Thank and, you so much. And Absolutely. thank you all for joining us. We will see you next week. Even if you have never written a book, you are still an author. In fact, we all are. In every moment, each of us is writing our own unique story that we call our lives. Because many of us are, as in the lyrics of the Dan Hill song, Sometimes When We Touch, writers still trapped within our truth. If this is you, why not start writing your thoughts in a journal? It will help you get your truth on paper and could just be the start of your own book. And don't forget to join us here every week for the next edition of The Editor's Desk.